Welcome to our Bible study today. My name is Tim Bell and I attend Northside Baptist Church and I hope that you'll tune in each week as we look at the various scriptures that the Lord has given to us through his holy word, the Bible. <clears throat> the next uh, few weeks we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Just to kind of give you a summary here, convicted by the Spirit is going to be today. Next week is born again by the Spirit then indwelt by the Spirit, then filled with the Spirit, and then walking with the Spirit, and then united with the Spirit. So for the next six weeks, we're going to be talking about the work of the Holy Spirit. So if you've ever wondered about that, this is your chance to learn a little bit more uh, in depth about the Holy Spirit and the ministry that He has for you. So we're going to go ahead and get started, and first we're going to have a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit as he dwells within us, gives us the words to say, helps us, Lord, through the wisdom that only you can give to understand your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so if you'll turn with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. And we're talking about the convicting uh, spirit, the conviction that the spirit places upon us. Now, uh, Convicting and convincing are two different things. Somebody may convince you to play baseball, but you may really not like playing too much. You just do it because they convince you to do it. But you may be convicted to play baseball if you're really into it and it's become a part of your life. You just can't live without playing baseball. And so it's become a, a, a um, what would I say? Well. You know, you know, certainly it has become a, a convicting, a convicted part of your life and that you're just not going to do this on a whim, but you're going to learn to do it better and you're just going to be obsessed about it. That's the difference. And so when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we don't talk about being convinced by the Holy Spirit. We talk about being convicted by the Holy Spirit. Convinced by the Holy Spirit would give the idea that he's hanging around, trying to get you to believe in God, try to get you to believe in Jesus, try to get you saved, try to get you to do this and that. Uh, the convicting spirit means that he's changing you. He's changing your whole outlook on life, your, your whole outlook on the way that you look at God and the spirit. So that's the difference. And we're going to talk about the convicting spirit. And it's great that Jesus gave us this counselor, which he is called, this Holy Spirit, that convicts us, doesn't convince us, but convicts us to do the right thing as far as accepting Christ as Lord and Savior. And we'll talk about that in the next few times. Uh, and, and then to walk with him, to be filled with the Spirit and to walk with Jesus and to do the things that Christ wants us to do. And it's not because we're doing it on our own, but we're doing it because of the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. There are a lot of martyrs uh, in the... In the past centuries and even today that die because of their conviction, their conviction of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They're more than just convinced that he is, but they are convicted in the sense that they will give their very life in order to walk with him and to stand with him to the very end. So John chapter 15, verse 26, and Jesus has not uh, died yet, but he's getting close to it. He's, uh, you know, he's coming to Jerusalem and he, this is right before they, uh, he washes the servant's feet, right before the Last Supper, etc. And he's trying to tell the people, tell the disciples the importance of what God is going to do for them. And he says, when the counselor comes, so he uses counselor as a name for the Holy Spirit. Now, if you've seen Matlock or Perry Mason or... Um, the Lincoln Lawyer or any law show, you, uh, you hear the fact that a lawyer is called a counselor. He's called counselor or she is called counselor because they counsel the individual on what to say and what not to say. They counsel them on the facts and counsel, and, uh, counsel them on the fact that they will stand with them while they're actually in the trial. And you've seen those at times when somebody's asked a question and they look at their lawyer to see if they should answer it or not or if they answer in the right way. So they are getting counsel all this time. And so it says, so Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the counselor, somebody who's going to stand with you, uh, listen to what you say, 
and lift you up and help you through each moment of your life. So when the counselor comes, it says, the one I will send to you from the Father, he is the spirit of truth. He proceeds from the Father. He will testify about me. So we find out then that the Holy Spirit is not just a counselor, but he is also the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth. He is truthful. He does not lie. He only tells the truth. That's a good thing to know in today's uh, political uh, world and people who you know that may lie constantly. You never know if they're telling the truth or not. And you always wonder. People have quit, myself included, almost quit watching the news because of all the lies that go on. And you really, I'm really just kind of wasting my time. I don't know what's true and what's not. And so why even bother with it? It's unfortunate, but that's the way that the world has gone. And the more popular that uh, social media has become, the more, and or I should say, the less people have faith in true facts, because then you can get into all kinds of fallacies and things. Uh, I, uh, I I don't have a phone. I don't want a phone. I don't have Facebook. I don't want it. Uh, to me, it's just caused problems and difficulties. There are a few good things about it, but in general, it has, as far as I'm concerned, basically, uh, that's why we're so split as a nation. It's because of people who normally would never say anything bad about anybody else. But for some reason, when they get on Facebook or whatever, they'll say, they will say anything. And there's hurt feelings and everything else. And there's a bunch of falsehoods that are perpetrated too. So people, they look at their Facebook or they look at their Twitter or they look at uh, their emails and they say, oh, well, I guess this is true because such and such said so or because somebody's gossiping about this. So it must be true. They don't even check it out. They, they just assume that it's true. People have come to me and told me things that have happened. And I said, what, what, what are you talking about? That hasn't happened. And they said, yeah, it has. And I said, show me the proof. You know, show me your sources. And so they go, well, Aunt Jane said that. And I said, well, where did she get her sources? Tell me, where is this coming from? And then when I get down to the very source of it, I find out that what has happened, the information has either been distorted or totally made up. And so you need to be sure and do that. And the Holy Spirit is truth. Uh, today, to me, the world is confusing because of all the lies all the lies that are told on and on and on by everybody. Lies, lies, lies. What are we so supposed to believe? We don't know what to believe, so we just give up. The Holy Spirit is different. The Holy Spirit convicts you and tells you the truth. He is the spirit of truth. In a, in, in a world that is so turned upside down by facts and fallacies and everything else, what is really the truth? Well, I know the Holy Spirit brings truth. And when the Holy Spirit, the counselor, brings to us the good news, brings to us how we can walk closer to the Lord, brings to us ideas in our mind and in our head, I know those are truthful. I know that's what he wants me to do. I know the Holy Spirit leads me to do the right thing because he wants the truth. He is the truth and we are to follow the truth. Now, if you know somebody, like when you were a kid, you totally trusted your parents. You'd do anything. You would believe them for anything. I mean, I remember one time I was coming home from work and my little girl was standing out on the porch and it was about a mm, three, three and a half foot drop and she was two. And I, I, she used to jump off the porch and I'd catch her all the time. I got home from work one night and she was up on the porch and she was running to the edge because she knew I could catch her while I was 20 feet away. And I ran as fast as I could and I barely got her. But that's the kind of trust that she had in me. And that's the kind of trust that we need to have in the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is God's mouthpiece. Um, and anyway, he says that not only is he the spirit of truth, but he proceeds from the Father. He comes from the Father and he will testify about me. So the Holy Spirit is going to testify about Jesus Christ. There's a lot of people that saw Jesus while he was here, but many people didn't and in today's age and all no one has but we do know him because of the Holy Spirit the Spirit of truth has pointed us in the direction of Jesus Christ and illuminates who he is the Son of God our Savior our good the Good Shepherd the one who walks with us and helps us carry our burdens and our loads the one who is totally truthful the one who loves everyone unconditionally the one who took away sin from people, even though we didn't deserve it. 
That is the kind of Savior that the Holy Spirit points us to. He tells us the truth about Jesus. You didn't know Jesus. I didn't know Jesus. But I know the Holy Spirit. And through the Holy Spirit, I know Jesus. Okay, so let's uh, let's turn then to... Um, to um, verse 7. It says, Nevertheless, I am telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the Counselor will not come to you. I don't know why the Holy Spirit and Jesus could not be here at the same time, but that's, that is a theme in the Bible. And even though it's not clearly explained, we just take that for granted because that's what the Bible teaches. Uh, we know that Jesus, when he went away, the Holy Spirit was able to come. He says, if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. So Jesus said, I'm going to leave I'm going to do something uh, for you and that I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and he is going to fill the void that I left when I left your world. Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you without help. I'm not going to leave you without a counselor. I'm not going to leave you without somebody to give you aid and, and, and comfort and wisdom and guidance and knowledge. I'm not going to do that. I, I, I'm leaving. So, you know, goodbye but I'm going to send somebody in my stead to take care of everything that I did and even more. And so he said, uh, if, verse seven, uh, if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world about sin. So the Holy Spirit is going to convict the world of their sin. Now, when Jesus was here, he, um, he told people about their sins, etc. Uh, but he still loved people and accepted them unconditionally. So the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to pick up where Jesus left off and he's going to convict people of the sin in their lives. If people do not know the sin in their lives or if they do not feel that they've sinned, they'll never become Christians. They'll never change because they feel that the sin that they have is not really bad, it's not evil, and therefore we can just carry it on and forget about everything else. But the Holy Spirit is going to convict you that those things are sinful. Now, you may continue to do them, but you're going to do it with a heavy heart because you're going to know right from wrong. It's not just something that you've made up or something you've heard on TV or in the news or something. This is coming from the Holy Spirit. And this is a conviction that is more than convincing. It is a conviction that changes your life. So when people become convicted, sometimes they'll say, well, I don't want to become a Christian. I've got too many things to do. I've got to um, you know, do this hobby and do that hobby. And I don't have time for church. And I really don't want to give any money to anybody because I want to keep it myself, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All kinds of excuses and reasons why somebody does not become a Christian. But the Holy Spirit continues to work on them, continues to work in their lives. And sometimes because we have free will, sometimes we never actually walk to the light and accept what the Holy Spirit has told us. And many times we do. And we become Christians and accept Christ, not because of anything we've done or really anything anybody told us, but because the Holy Spirit has worked in our lives and convicted us, has taken all of these things that, 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 that we see around us and has actually convicted us through them. So he said, when he comes, he will convict the world about sin Righteousness, he will convict people and let them know about righteousness, what's right, what's the right thing to do, what's the good thing to do, because the Holy Spirit doesn't just convict on sin. He also tells us the positive things. Um, and then he says, in judgment. And so the Holy Spirit is going to look around, and even though Jesus said that I did not come to judge people, but that people would be judged through me, what that means is, is that Jesus didn't come to point fingers at people, but because of the very life that Jesus led, when you compare your life to his life, you're judging yourself through Jesus indirectly. He's kind of the plumb line when you build a building or what have you. And I know they have all kinds of lasers now and everything else, but back in the olden days, it just had a plumb bob or a plumb line and you just could hang it from a string. And it's the same thing that uh, Jeremiah talks about in the Old Testament. And, and you, you, you set this string up and, and it will show you, because it's got a weight on it, it will show you if you've got that wall straight or not. 
And that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit, that's what Jesus did. He himself didn't make the, the, the wall crooked. He didn't say that wall's crooked, but he says, judge me by my accuracy. Judge the crookedness of the wall by the plumb line, and you'll see that your wall is straight or not. And it's based on the plumb line. It's not based on the plumb line pointing his finger at somebody and saying, do this or do that. But we are judged, we are judged by the accuracy of the level or the plumb line or whatever it may be. And so Jesus said that that is what I, what I am. That's who I am. Uh, I am an individual. I am somebody who's going to come and you are going to be through the spirit are going to be judged by your works, not by the spirit, but you're, well, it, you are indirectly, but by looking at the spirit and when the spirit convicts you of the right thing, then you're going to see when you set your life against those concepts, you're going to see how how short that you fall. So, and then it says, verse 9, about sin. Uh, th this is about the judgment. It says, let me, let me read that first part again. If I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, and you will no longer see me. And about judgment, because the rule of this world has been judged. Okay, so he just kind of puts everything uh, all together here. He says the Holy Spirit is going to convict you of the presence of Jesus Christ and the knowledge of him and what he did for you, your Savior. He's also going to, at the same time, uh, show that this righteousness, because he's going to go to his Father, sit at the right hand, and he is made righteous. He is made righteous because of the conviction, because of the... Uh, uh, crucifixion because of the sacrifice that Jesus made he did the right thing and he's the righteous one and we can become righteous if we accept him and the sacrifice that he made for us we'll never be as righteous as Jesus of course but we will be righteous in our own mind in our own sense in that the Holy Spirit makes us right with God when we accept his convicting spirit in our lives and change those lives and get sin out of our lives we're still going to sin but not not uh, as much as we used to. We're gonna try harder not to. We're gonna be convicted when we do, where in the past we weren't. So it makes a big difference. Uh, and then he says, um, the ruler of this world has been judged. Well, the ruler of this world, as you know, is Satan. So he has been judged through the death of Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, he crossed that line, Jesus crossed that line, to take his, our sins upon himself and to bring judgment once again on, the, on Satan, on the devil. But he also shows to all of us how short we fall and how unrighteous we are because we, we, we want to reach out and achieve the goals that Jesus set for us. We can't always do that. It's very difficult. We can't always do it. But the Holy Spirit is there to give you power and strength and help to carry out these things that the Holy Spirit expects us to do. So we can see that's first part of the convicting of the Spirit. He does more than just it convicts us about Jesus Christ. He convicts us about everything. He convicts us about how righteous we are, uh, the, the judgment that's come upon the world, the leader of the world, Satan. Uh, he talks about, you know, this, this idea of of you know conviction and instead of just being convinced so there are a lot of things that the holy spirit's going to do and i'm just barely getting into them but we'll talk about more of them as we move along uh, it, it says here that uh, that that trouble's going to come you know jesus said and john we talked about this a few weeks ago he kept telling the disciples that trouble was going to come their way they were going to be kicked out of the synagogues that they were going to be persecuted. And then he told them about the fall of, of uh, Jerusalem that Rome was going to put upon them and told them to flee to the hills, etc. So there, were, there was going to be a lot of things that was going to occur. A martyrdom of the people, like say intense persecution, um, all these things, but Jesus has provided them with comfort. That's what the book of Revelation does. John wrote that just like he wrote this gospel. John wrote the book of Revelation. And if you read through that, it is not really a, some kind of science fiction movie. It is comfort to the early church 
that Rome is going to persecute, destroy, kill, maim, uh, dome to the lions, you know, whatever, you know, all these terrible things that happen to the Christians, that it's going to happen. And he's trying to give to the people comfort. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't begin. Don't follow it, the emperor, but instead remain faithful to Christ. And we can use that same message in all that we do even today because we are persecuted in a sense, maybe not like the early Christians were, but we're persecuted in a sense. We don't really feel like that we fit in with the world. Sometimes we're afraid to say something or we stammer around or we're afraid to take a stand because uh, the people around us were afraid would think that we were crazy and they probably would. So, so we do have these things going on around us, but the Holy Spirit helps us through these things. And Jesus said, bad times, difficult times are going to occur. But remember that I am with you through the Holy Spirit. I will give you, I will tell you what to do and what to say. And I'll walk with you as you do and say these things. So, so we have a, a, you know, a, a very good introduction here about all these things. Now, uh, I was reading here and it said that, um, well, I'm just going to skip that because I've covered that well enough. So if you will, then turn with me to John chapter 16, verses 12 through 15. He says, I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. So Jesus is telling the disciples a lot of things. He's going to tell them a lot more things, but he's going to kind of put it on hold because he knows that they can't bear them right now. Because when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Now, I wonder what things that Jesus pulled up short by telling the people. Was it the persecution they were going to um, incur? Was it walking close to the whole, with the Holy Spirit when they didn't really know who the Holy Spirit was yet? And they wouldn't understand. And so Jesus thinks, well, I can't even tell you these things because you can't really bear them now. You're not even going to understand. Uh, by bear them, that means uh, pick up or uh, hold close uh, and, and walk with the information that you have to make it a part of your life. So he says, so, you know, you, you can't bear these things right now. Uh, and Jesus is saying, uh, you know, there, uh, there's going to be tough times. You know, I talked to you about... Um, walking the extra mile and turning your cheek and forgiving those who don't forgive you and loving your neighbor and your enemy. He said, those, those are too tough for you to understand. You're, you're not going to really get that. Uh, but if you wait around and put things on hold for a minute until the Holy Spirit comes, then you will understand. Then you will see where I'm coming from. Uh, you, you know, we actually today, if you think about it, we have greater advantages than people who actually knew Jesus. Because Jesus from the outside was telling people what to do and how to act and, and trying to change it. But the Holy Spirit does it within us. The Holy Spirit comes inside us, in our, in our souls, in our minds, in our hearts, and changes us and convicts us. Jesus a lot of times tried to convince people that he was the Messiah because of miracles and things like that. But the Holy Spirit ain't going to do that. You don't, you don't have to have miracles in these things anymore. You don't need miracle workers and, and all this garbage that goes on today and in a lot of these mega churches and and um, even small churches and whatever they may be who who uh, misinterpret what the scripture says uh, and so and so we, uh, we're not going to need that because the holy spirit is not going to come and sit next to you in a pew at church he's not going to sleep next to you in bed at night he's not going to walk with you while you walk during the day he is going to be inside you he is going to uh, to to be your skeleton he's going to um, change the way you think he's going to change the way you walk change the way you talk uh, he's going to turn your life from sin into righteousness uh, and that's that's what the holy spirit's going to do for you he's going to show you the truth from within and so it says that uh, jesus said i still have many things to tell you but you you know you can't bear them now we understand these things now we've seen it happen and we know the um, occurrences uh, paul talked about the spirit uh, James did, uh, John did, uh, you know, uh, later disciples, uh, Jude, and uh, I say uh, disciples, writers of the books, uh, Philip, um, you know, you know, different ones, a letter to the Philippians, Paul, all of these things, they tell us about the Holy Spirit, and they, not ju they do not just give us information about it, but they allow us to understand about the Spirit, and He's come into our lives, He has come into us and convicted us. So He said, 
I can't tell you a lot of these things because you can't bear them. You won't understand them. Uh, he also meant by that is that I can tell you some things are going to happen to you that are going to be persecution, but you couldn't handle it. You couldn't stand it. So let's just forget it for right now because the Holy Spirit will come into your life. And then when these hard, hard times come, he will give you the words to say. So he said, there's no point in me going through all these things right now. Um, you, you don't have the help of the Spirit to get you through them. Just that, you know, that th these things will take care of themselves. I've told you what you need to know. When the Spirit, this is verse 13, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Uh, that's a great thing. We've already talked about the truth already and how untruthful everything is and the world is built around falsehoods. Well, the Holy Spirit is not like that. He's going to come and tell you the truth. Now, that should give you a whole new lease on life to know that you do not have to trust anybody or you don't have to trust who you hear on the radio. You don't have to hear about the um, broadcasters on TV. You don't have to hear about individual uh, people and what they say. You don't have to believe in what I say uh, because the Holy Spirit is going to give you the truth. And that's what you need to believe. I'm not perfect. I'm sure that I say some things that I shouldn't say as far as biblical truth, etc. Uh, there may be some uh, scriptures that I'm mixed up on a little bit, uh, but but uh, but the Holy Spirit will guide you through those and will help you to see the right the the, the, the light, the right way in which to go. Uh, so it says, when the Spirit of Truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own, but He will speak whatever He hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. He will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. Everything the Father has is mine. This is why I told you that he takes from what is mine and will declare it to you. Okay, these, these last verses uh, are, are very um, uplifting and very inspiring to the disciples. Jesus is finally connecting all the dots. He said, you know, before you knew that you, you knew there was Father, you knew there was God the Father. You knew that from your Old Testament studies. Um, now you know me, God the Son. I have come, and I and the Father are one, and I've come to show you these things and to direct you and the love that God has for you and to show that love and to demonstrate it to you. And now that you're going to get the Holy Spirit on top of all that, and He's going to convict you with all these things. He is going to not just show you what's happened or tell you about God or tell you about Jesus, but he is going to convict you, convict your heart to make changes, to accept Christ in your life, to accept the changes that God has for you, to accept the challenges that God has given to you and to know that you do not have to walk alone, that God is going to walk with you through the Holy Spirit. And and that's, that's what it says here, that... Uh, that the Holy Spirit will guide you in truth, for he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. So he's going to speak. The Holy Spirit is, is God's voice. Uh, the Holy Spirit isn't just some uh, radical kind of entity that's running around doing his own thing. He is speaking the truth from God, who from the very beginning has always said the same thing. And the Holy Spirit is telling us what God it, it wants for us. He's telling us that God is not a vindictive, hateful God, but he is a God of truth, a God of love, a God that makes a difference in the world. So the Holy Spirit is extremely important, and he's not going to deter from the way people used to think about God, but instead he's going to enhance what Jesus said about God, and then he's going to convict people that what Jesus said was true, and that God definitely needs to be a part of their lives. Uh, he says uh, that, that that the Holy Spirit says, um, Jesus says that he will glorify me. He will take from from what is mine and declare it to you. So he says the Holy Spirit's going to carry on my ministry. He's going to take what I had and share it with you. Uh, everything the Father has is mine. So Jesus basically says whatever the Father has, heaven and all these things, the, the gates of heaven, the glory, uh, uh, all powerful, all present, uh, he always here, always here, uh, always listens, uh, totally loving. All these things Jesus says that my Father has, I have. We, we have the same truth, the same characteristics, because we all believe in the same truth. And we come from the same, um, from the same source, and that is we're all the same, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we would have to be in unison with the truth. 
Uh, he said, everything that the Father has is mine. So Jesus is saying, you know, whatever God has is mine. The, the mountains, the, the trees, uh, forgiveness of sin, um, you know, his great wisdom, his great love, uh, everything that God has, Jesus has. So he says, that is why I told you that he takes from what is mine and will declare it to you. So the Holy Spirit is going to take what is Jesus, what is God's, and declare it to you. There's going to be no uh, inconsistencies. There's going to be nobody who's going to um, say one thing and things are going to end up being another. No, that's not what God's going to do. That's not what the Holy Spirit's going to do. That's not what Jesus is going to do. They love you and they are in unison. And what one says, the other says. They're all the spirit of truth. Okay, so that's that's the first chapter. And it's talking about this conviction of the Holy Spirit. Uh, next week, we'll look at um, uh, born again by the Spirit. Born again. That's very interesting on how the Holy Spirit works in letting people know who Jesus Christ was. So let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. Thank you for sharing with us today. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, for standing with us, for giving us hope, for giving us love and grace, for letting us know of your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. And may we obey you. And may we be convicted by your spirit in carrying out the work that you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen.